Hi, and thank you so much for joining us in an exciting new series we're beginning, conversations with some of the Maryland Symphony Orchestra's most revered colleagues, musical colleagues, and friends. Today we have, uh, this evening, we have someone very special who I'll announce very soon. But in the meantime, let me say to you, all of you, uh, we hope you are staying healthy and well and safe uh, we truly miss you and we look forward to seeing you in person when we can all join together uh, in a good, safe way. In the meantime, we're going to keep present online and bring you music in our encore presentations and also wonderful videos from our players and uh, other exciting projects online to keep you engaged and let you know how much we care about you and how much we miss you. As I say, this is the first in a series of conversations, and it is very appropriate that we begin with a friend of the symphony who's performed four times before, uh, even before I came on board as music director. Sharon Isbin uh, appeared with the orchestra with Maestro Barry Tuckwell. Uh, she was young, but she was already established as one of the superstars in the guitar firmament. And so we welcome her this evening to join us in conversation. And please um, be part of that conversation as you contribute um, your questions for her. So welcome, Sharon Isbin. I, I would also like to thank uh, Antietam, um, uh, Antietam Broadcast for uh, sponsoring this conversation and also for being such loyal sponsors of us in this uh, sort of truncated 2019-2020 season. So Sharon, hello. Hi, it's great to be here, virtually. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, obviously, most of our audience knows exactly who you are, and I know that they can find out more information on your website, SharonIsbin.com. But um, uh, April 4th and 5th of 2020 was to be your fifth appearance with the Maryland Symphony Orchestra. And um, it is, of course, we are terribly disappointed that we were not able to perform the works of, uh, was it Rodrigo and also the recently passed Baltimore composer, Christopher Rouse. Right. But we are hoping to reschedule that for uh, next year, perhaps, um, as soon as possible. So we, we look forward to joining in performance with you. Uh, at, when we return to this stage in the Maryland Theater. We are here to celebrate uh, the release of your album, Affinity. Uh, it is exciting for us especially since we are the accompanying orchestra in Brubeck's concerto with the same title as your album, Affinity. Um, I'd love it if you could just, well, let's start off with some music from that concerto. Here's Chris Brubeck's Affinity. <laughs> Boy, that was so much fun to record and uh, so much fun to give the premiere in 2000. In 2015, we gave the yeah. premiere. Um, 
why don't you tell us a little bit about how that concerto came to be? You've you've recorded over thirty albums at this point. I'm not even sure what the number is, and um, and you've I'm commissioned not sure either. over uh, you've you've commissioned I think certainly over thirty works by uh, composers for the for you and for actually the over eighty guitar. over eighty works have been composed and arranged for me at this point. I've I've been counting them, so I'm really thrilled to have done the world premiere of this concerto with you conducting and the Maryland Symphony. And it actually came to pass in an unusual way, the first time something like this has ever happened. Chris and I met each other over 10 years ago. And at that time I was entranced by his music and I was very interested in having him write something for me. I never found the funding. So that kind of disappeared into the ether. And a few years ago, I was performing a concert and afterwards I was approached by a woman named Betsy Russell, who said, I would love to commission a concerto for you. I used to play the guitar. I love the instrument. Would you be interested? So then I talked to Elizabeth to see if she had any particular ideas. I've already worked with so many composers from John Coriano to Chris Rouse, Aaron Kernis, Tan Dunn, and a, a very long list. So. She said, well, what about Chris Brubeck? And I said, that's, that's a terrific idea. We had once talked about doing something together. And because Elizabeth and the symphony had done a number of his works before, it was a logical choice. So I got in touch with Chris. He was really thrilled with the idea. And I decided that because of our joint interest in multi-genres of music, that it would be really something that he could celebrate in the concerto, introducing different styles of music. And in fact, that's where the title came from. Uh, he knows that I have worked in the jazz world with different collaborators in the rock world, people like Steve Vai and even Joan Baez in folk music. So he decided to call this piece Affinity. And Affinity, I'm just gonna read you the quotation that he took from that definition an attraction or force between particles that causes them to combine. So it's taking all of these different styles of music, our different interests, and it actually ends up being a great title for the album as well as, as we talk about that more. Fantastic. Um, I will say that uh, Chris Brubeck has been a friend to the Maryland Symphony. We performed a couple of his concertos, one for Nicholas Kendall and then one for his group Time for Three. And I had performed a uh, uh, Chris's trombone concerto with Chris as the soloist in Flagstaff. So we went way back as well. He is the most wonderful person and a remarkable, wonderful composer as well as, as we well know. And so when you were asking me for uh, my thoughts on who, uh, who might write a great concerto. Well, I, I knew right off that Chris Brubeck was was the great candidate for for you for the next one, at least. Um, and, and it was I really inter it, interesting what happened, um, because never before in my experience working with composers did, did a composer actually ask me to give input as they were writing the piece on the music itself. I've, I've often had to explore what the different guitar techniques are like and change voicing and change chording and make it idiomatic, throw notes out here and there and all of that. But he actually said, I'd like to drop by one day and just play you some sketches that I've written what, and see what you think. So when that happened, I shared with Elizabeth what was going on and he was just so receptive and it takes somebody with a very strong inner core and a, a real solidity and self-confidence to be able to open up themselves in a vulnerable way like he did to ask for my influence and her influence in the process of writing. And what- Yes, um, if you could tell us about, um, I remember because I, I, he also uh, spoke with me about things, particularly about uh, orchestration. And I was so thrilled to have uh, him ask me for input and suggestions. It was, an, as you say, a very rare thing and uh, showed a great deal of confidence on his part um, and, and, and openness. Um, I would love it if you could tell the story about the slow section of the concerto and how that came to be, because that folds right into what we were just talking about. 
well, one of his several visits to my home with his little samples and his scores that he printed out involved playing a section from the this middle slow part. And it was interesting. It was a, a jazzy kind of feeling, but it didn't really connect to me. And I called him up and I said, because he had sent the, the actual tape to listen to, I called him up and I said, you know, I was thinking about you had lost your father, his father being Dave Brubeck. And of course, this is the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of Dave Brubeck this year. So it's very timely that this, this concerto should come out. I said, you lost your father, you lost your mother all in the last year. I was wondering perhaps there might be some sort of musical tribute, even with some of his music that you might want to introduce into this piece, maybe, maybe the slow section. And he said, I am so glad that you asked me that because he said, I, I, I thought perhaps you only wanted me to write music that was my own. And I said, no, I want you to write what is in your heart, whatever that is. So he said, well, thank you. And no sooner had that happened, but he sent me a couple of, actually three or four ballads of his father. Elizabeth and I listened and we both just zoomed right in on the one called Autumn. And I said, Chris, that is just so beautiful, meltingly so. And he said, well, it's, it's interesting because I used to perform this with my father. And he said, I'm actually sitting at the window. It's, it's autumn now, looking out the window where we used to compose and rehearse. And I'm seeing the leaves drop from the trees. And it, that piece just came to my mind. So he ended up on his own, scrapping the whole slow section that he had written before and taking a beautiful orchestration that he created of his father, Dave Brubeck's Autumn and putting that into the piece. And that became the real center core of it and flanked on both sides are all this wild, fast, virtuosic stuff that includes Middle Eastern music and jazz influences, even a waltz. Well, we'll hear a little bit more of it um, a little bit later in the, in the conversation. But I wanted to um, talk or ask you about uh, some other roles that you play uh, during your your year. And one of them, of course, is you are the founder and head of the guitar department at Juilliard and head of the department at uh, the Aspen Music School as well. You're uh, uh, not only a teacher there, but a performing artist at the Aspen Festival. Um, this is an important role that you play. You have mentored uh, many wonderful young guitarists, and one of those is featured in this album. Um, he, he, uh, you're playing with him in a duet. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about that, because and the importance of, of your teaching as well. Well, I've had students at Juilliard since I created the department from 20 different countries. And many of them have gone back to become the premier players where, the, where they live. And one of those players, Colin Davin, received his master of music degree with me at Juilliard. I had actually started working with him when he was a, a young teenager at the Aspen Music Festival. And I invited him several years ago to play duet concerts with me. So we've been doing that for several years now. And I recalled an, an amazing experience that I had back in Caracas, Venezuela, when I was actually at a party and I was playing some music by their premier composer, the late Antonio Lauro, one of his waltzes. And the waltz is named Natalia and it's named after his daughter, Natalia. His daughter, Natalia, was at that party and she picked up a guitar, a folk instrument from Venezuela and started to accompany me in, in an improvisatory manner where she would be doing the, the Venezuelan folk style strumming while I played Natalia. And I'd never forgotten what an amazing experience that was. So I said to Colin, who's also a very fine arranger, I asked, I said, what would you think about your writing a second guitar part to this piece for me to play that would be in that kind of Venezuelan folk style? So what he came up with was so lovely that I asked him to join me on this, on this album. It's, it's gorgeous. Let's listen to a little bit of it. Thank you. 
uh, you can you can hear the sort of the improvisatory uh, improvisatory uh, aspect style of, of what he's of doing. Yes. yes, absolutely. It's beautiful. and in the repeats he changes it all up and does tapping, and it's it's really very very creative. Oh, that's wonderful. And let me remind uh, those who are watching us and and uh, that you can be part of this conversation as well. If you have any questions, please type them right in. And our wonderful producer, uh, Michael Harp, our director of marketing and public relations is who is uh, keeping us on online right now, um, will gather up those questions and pass them on to us. So uh, please participate in the conversation if you wish, you're more than welcome. We look forward to hearing from you. Uh, Sharon, uh, this album has so many aspects to it, but the most important thing, of course, is that every single work on the album was written specifically for you um, to uh, kind of, I would say that each composer must have interacted with you, must have known your your style, uh, known you a little bit, I hope, and uh, written specifically for you perhaps to, um, I, I don't know if that's true or not, so maybe I should just ask that question. Um, what are the relationships you've had with, with each of these composers on the album? And, well, the, and how did the works that they wrote for you sort of- um, Come to be. Come to be, indeed. There are five tracks on this album. The Brubeck Concerto is the first one. The second one is by the legendary Cuban composer guitarist, Leo Brower. And Leo Brower I met many, many years ago before anybody knew who he was. He was making his North American debut at the Toronto Festival where I had competed and, and actually won the competition somehow. And I heard him for the first time and just became intrigued by his music and got found everything I could get my hands on to learn. And I would eventually send him recordings of things that I made of his music. So one day, out of the blue, we had never discussed his writing a piece, but one day I received a package in the mail. He sent it from Mexico and I opened it up and there was El de Camarón Negro de dedicated to me, a three part beautiful work inspired by love poetry from Africa collected by 19th century German anthropologist named Leon Frobenius. And these are programmatic in style. It describes a warrior who is much beloved by his tribe and had saved them from many an attacking force. Then when they discovered that he wanted to play the harp and he loved playing the harp, they decided to banish him. So this is a metaphor for many different kinds of things in our world, our society today, sadly. And so in that programmatic nature, you, you'll hear galloping of the horses. Then the, the third ballad is called La Doncella Enamorada. This is the ballad of the maiden in love. So each of them is different in their styles. They have Afro-Cuban elements to them of the call and response. And of course, the brilliant insight that Leo as a guitarist has in writing for the instrument. Well, that leads right into one of my favorite sections from that work. Um, it's in the Canyon of Echoes. And um, if you wanna give a little background about that, I'd, I'd appreciate it because even technically when we watch you play, and it is always wonderful to watch you play, to watch your hands um, and where they go, um, not so much the ones on the, the fingerboard, but where they go in terms of uh, your strumming and uh, your, your uh, really caressing the strings in many ways. And this, in this case, uh, to create the echo on the guitar. I mean, can you speak technically a little bit about how you did that? And then maybe we could hear a little bit of it. But first, uh, tell us how that how that is accomplished on the guitar. Sure. The The title of this particular ballad, it's the second one, it's called La Huida de los Amantes por el Valle de los Echos, or Fleeing of the Lovers Through the Valley of the Echos. This is the point at which he's been banished by the tribe. So the part that we're gonna hear, this little excerpt, is where they're actually going full tilt, full blast into the canyon. And of course, we all know how a canyon has echoes. So Brower created this fabulous effect by having the right hand do very fast triplets that alternate between loud and soft immediately. And you can hear that effect as if the horses were galloping in the valley. So let's hear that and, and see how that, how that sounds.
really cool. Um, we've received some questions from our watchers, um, our audience, and uh, one of them fits very well into this topic that we're talking about right now. And that question is, how did you embody the pieces written for you? And, you know, I know each piece is very different. Each composer is very different. Your relationship to them and the music is obviously going to be different as well. Yes, and, and I, I think because you're breaking um, up here a little bit, I'm going to interject yeah. and just say that I've been very fortunate to work directly with the composers. So with Brower, I coached on his piece with him. And in some of the other works that are on this album, Affinity, for example, the, the work that follows the Brower is by Tan Dun, the Chinese composer. He's best known for writing the music to Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And he wrote a concerto for me, for Tan Dun, who was one of the people who was, had been persecuted during the Cultural Revolution. He was forced to leave the capital and go become a farmer in the countryside, a rice farmer. At that time, he was forbidden to play Western music, couldn't have his instrument, and would just research folk, folk music of China. And he would take anything he could, stones, sticks, pots, pans, and try to express himself. And all of that stayed with him. What happened was a very freak and tragic accident where all of the members of the Peking Opera Orchestra were on a boat that capsized, they drowned, and the government was forced to recall everybody like Tan Dun that they needed to fill their seats in the orchestra. So he came back to Peking, it was called that at that time. And from there, he was able to make his way back to the United, not back, but make his way to the United States and the rest is history. So he celebrates in this piece, it's called Seven Desires for Guitar. It's inspired by the concerto that he wrote for me some years back called Yi Tu. He celebrates the ancient Chinese lute, which is a plucked instrument and it's called the pipa. And the pipa is played with a plectrum. Actually, it's played with fingernails that are metal, that are plectrum is put on each of the right hand fingers and they go in this direction. We use our fingernails and we go in the opposite direction. We share a lot of interesting things in common. He was wanting to draw on the Spanish history of the guitar and go back to flamenco and gestures of flamenco, the stomping and the clapping and the strumming. So on the pipa, they do a lot of strumming, they do bent notes, but they're ghostly evocations. Whereas when we do bent notes, it's more like a la Jimi Hendrix. And one of the hallmarks of people playing is to use the pick back and forth in quick succession like that with their fingers, actually, I keep thinking of the sarod, but these are fingers going back like this. And they're able to, and actually in that direction, they're able to sustain a pitch for a very long time. So I had to adapt our tremolo technique from guitar to create something that would be similar to that. So I would use the thumb in, in this fashion. And one of the greatest compliments that Tan Dun paid to me, he said, my God, after hearing this piece, he said, you sound like a pipa player. So it worked. And the seven desires express the desire of the guitar to be a pipa. And that so is part that of way, the journey. That's fantastic. So in, in that way, you learn to embody the music uh, by understanding its roots and uh, doing some research into uh, understanding how the native instruments are played. Um, it, it makes all the difference in the world, I'm sure. And you mentioned the Sarad because uh, I know that you have another album coming out at the same time as this. Uh, uh, it's Strings for Peace. If you could tell us a little bit about that, that would be fantastic. Sure, and actually the last piece on Affinity leads into Strings for Peace because it's by Richard Danielpour. It's a commission that Carnegie Hall asked him to create for me and for Isabel Leonard, who joins me in the song cycle in poetry by Rumi, which is very beautiful and evocative in its love stories. And that whole concept of Rumi, I think, is a nice transition into Strings for Peace. I've been collaborating with Amjad Ali Khan, the legendary Sarad player, who comes from the sixth generation in his family of Sarad players. Sarad is another instrument that is plucked also with a plectrum. It's a metal instrument and there are no frets. So it is one that is able to create all kinds of nuances 
of in-between pitches as they play in slides. He had contacted me, Amjad Ali Khan, more than 10 years ago, and he wanted to meet and to forge a collaboration. And in that process, we became friends, also with his two brilliant sons, Aman Ali Bangash and Ayan Ali Bangash. And by the time all of this percolating of his idea to compose ragas for guitar and sarad for me to do with them happened, it was really in December of 2018 that I got a message. This was after many meetings over the years. And Ayan said, hey, check your inbox. I've just sent you some ragas that my father has composed for us. Tell me what you think. I listened and they were just gorgeous. And he said, good, because we booked a tour for you to do with us in India in a couple of months in February, 2019. And I said, couldn't we make that a little bit later? And they said, no, no, we, we've got the halls, Mumbai, Calcutta wow. and Delhi. And he said, let's just, just jump into it. So I was about to do another album in January. So I really didn't have any time. I was recording with the Pacifica string quartet. We'll get to that in a moment. That was called Souvenirs of Spain and Italy. So I really only had a very few weeks right before India to learn the ragas and learn the intricate style of playing. I came to India early so that we could rehearse nonstop and they could teach me the various intricacies of the improvisatory nature. And it really struck me how similar that is to playing with jazz musicians that I have done. Everybody from Laurindo Almeida to Larry Coriel to Romero Lubambo and Stanley Jordan. These are all people I've performed with and I've gotten used to kind of going with the swing of what they do, even though I'm a classical player. That so, ties into a, a question that was just um, sent to us, which is about the notation. I mean, so many different styles and so many different approaches to how that must be expressed on paper. Um, how do you learn all the different notations? I mean, and also all the contemporary works that you've performed by various uh, various composers who each have their own style and their own set of, of special notation as well. And uh, certainly it's, there is much that is standard, but some of it must be different, particularly in things like Tan Dunn's work. Um, how do you, how do you handle it all? Well, working with the composer is helpful. They'll say, well, gee, how do I get you to make this kind of sound tapping here and this kind tapping there and this pizzicato alla Bartok effect and, uh, Oftentimes, it would actually involve me rewriting something. So in the case of Chris Brubeck, the concerto that we did together, I was kind of surprised because he's a guitarist in a sense he's, he's an electric guitarist. And I, and I figured I probably wouldn't have to change too much, but I found myself spending dozens and dozens of hours editing the music, learning it and finding out at tempo which notes I could keep and which I had to change. So as the piece went on, it, it got actually more and more complex in that regard. And I said, Chris, I, I was a little surprised by that. And he said, oh, I figured you would fix it. So he was in a rush to write and he figured I would fix it. So that's what happened. And in, <laughs> and in the case of John Coriano, he was so scared really of writing for the guitar that everything I sent him, he would kind of hide away, even a guitar. He put it in his closet and was afraid to look at it. So it, it each composer had a different approach to how they would do things together. In the case of Amjad Ali Khan, it actually took eight years before they found a collaborator who was skilled as a jazz player, as a classical guitarist, as someone who knew Indian music, who had studied with Amjad Ali Khan, who could actually notate the arrangements that were in Amjad's mind. And that really proved to be what broke the glass ceiling. It, it made it possible for me to start learning this music. It's fantastic. Um, listen, I, I I also wanted to mention that another album came out this year. Uh, you with chamber music, and well, I want to just show that album on on the screen. The souvenirs of Spain and Italy. Your uh, wonderful collaboration with the Pacifica Quartet. Fantastic works of Vivaldi and uh, uh, Castel. Tun What's it? How do you say it? Castel uh, Vivaldi, Castel Nuevo Tedesco. Thank you, Baccarini, <laughs> and they play actually a, a work by Turina. So these are. Uh, mostly Italian composers inspired by Spanish music. Thus, the and there's so many great stories about that. I won't even get into that. But yeah, we can't it was get fabulous. into it because we don't have a lot of time, unfortunately. But we have right. a lot of wonderful questions that I'd like you to be sure. able to answer. Um, and one of the first was uh, was in an important one, and it was 
that I think it was someone, so many concertos, someone right? was watching who was at the Maryland Theater. And um, they're thrilled it's on the album now. And they want to just know how, how it came about. And I will say this, you, you and I had been talking with Chris for quite a while about how we could get this um, recorded. You know, recorded. And, and so it took a lot of friends um, to help us uh, fund it. Uh, we have a lot of, of great donors um, who we are incredibly grateful to for helping us. And our then executive director, Stephen Marc Baudouin, uh, did a marvelous job in raising the funds to uh, allow the orchestra um, to, to join you on this recording, and um, as well as, as many other generous uh, donors. But the the biggest thing was to find a place to record. I'm going to jump in again because you're breaking up. At, um, uh, yes, we, we actually. Okay. Uh, Monica has Angeles at the Strathmore at Strathmore was um, so generous to let us use that space. What a what a yes, spectacular and, space! Yes, and we are to grateful to Strathmore and Monica for making that possible and to. Uh, Stephen Baudouin for organizing all of that. It actually turns out to be their first commercial recording at the Strathmore Center. So I, I'm, I can't wait to share this album with them because it is, is certainly a source of pride. And it was marvelous to work with the producer on this, Philip Traugott, who uh, just was amazing in his efforts to put everything together. We had a team of engineers from Tim Martin multi-Grammy winning engineer who I've worked with many, many times, Kevin Butotti and Brian Loesch, all of them were complicit in making this album come together. One of our players has a question. Um, she's tuning in and she says it was a great honor to play on the album and she asks you, how does playing with an orchestra that you have an existing relationship with differ from performing with a group that you do not know? It's a great question. And you do know it us actually, pretty well. Yes. Right? And, and Elizabeth, I've performed with you many times with the National Symphony and with other orchestras that preceded the Maryland Symphony. So one of the things that I can say about Elizabeth Schulz in her conducting with guitar is that she is so sensitive to issues of balance. I just don't even have to worry about it. And that is often the focal point of any new conductor that I work with is to really have them appreciate that I'm not a piano and I'm not a violin. And even though I have a microphone, it means a whole other way of structuring balance. But you are brilliant at doing that. And I so appreciate it. And I can imagine that working with an orchestra that knows you makes a very big difference. Um, you've traveled all over the world and uh, I'm sure that um, it makes a difference. It's almost like a homecoming for you when you join with a group that you know. Absolutely. And to have performed four times with the Maryland Symphony, it would have been our fifth last month, is, is just, it really is like family. And even though some of the players may have changed, some of them are still original players. And it's always great to see them and to make music together. And they did a fantastic job in this recording. We recorded it in September 2018. And the rest of the album I did in May of 2019. And here it is coming out this Friday, May 22nd. We're all very excited about it. And I, uh, having been in the um, the editor's room to watch him mix and uh, take all of our input, it took over 10 hours to mix um, after the initial edits. And it was an amazing um, thing to watch and to be part of. Uh, and what was so magnificent is how well the orchestra sounded from the very beginning and um, it, it just was for me a lot of great pride and, and happiness as a brilliant member of the orchestra. We're, we're losing you there, Elizabeth. So I'm going to just jump in again. So uh, one of I'm going to jump in again and, and say that. Um, how grateful I am to the symphony, to the musicians who gave of their time and their effort and their dedication and devotion to Chris Brubeck for making this possible, to Monica Jeffries-Hazangelis at the Strathmore Center for making the hall available to us, 
and to all of the people from Betsy Russell, who first commissioned the piece, who contributed to the recording, to our other friends who are all credited and listed with many, many thank yous in, in making this possible. And I, I know that this is a difficult time for many people because not, not only do we not have live concerts, but, but people are suffering in ways that are unimaginable. And we are so grateful to those who are helping us, the people who are taking care in the health care workers and uh, people who are delivering and, sh and sharing food, all of that. And if there were ever a time that music can be a healing and comforting thing, it is now. And I'm, I'm glad that even though we're unable to play for you in person, that we can share this music with you and that you can find, I hope, some comfort from that. That's a beautiful sentiment. Thank you very much. Um, let's hear a little bit more from Chris Brubeck's Affinity Guitar Concerto for Sharon Isbin and the Maryland Symphony. Wow, that was exciting. Uh, congratulations to you on the uh, the rolling out of this new album, Sharon, and thank you so much for your uh, collaboration with us. Someone asked whether or not you had a favorite piece beyond the Brubeck, and um, and yet the, and there's another question about your traveling to India and whether that uh, affected or shaped some of the ways that you make music now and your creative process. So maybe in the next the you have one more minute to tell us all okay. of that. <laughs> well, at this point, I've had more than a dozen concerti by different composers written for me. And I would say any any of the ones that I'm playing at the moment is a favorite. And I, I know that it's been exciting to play the Brubeck now already multiple different times with different orchestras, including the D Detroit Symphony. And in terms of India, I can say that I had kind of an epiphany on the first night of my playing on stage in Delhi where I was doing a Spanish work and all of a sudden it hit me that there was a familiarity of the Indian style that I had been working on with Amjad Ali Khan in the ragas with all of these melismatic Spanish nuances from the Cante Hondo of Flamenco. And I thought, of course, these are the gypsies that came, that migrated from India crossing many lands, many landed in Spain and became part of what ended up being the movement of Spanish flamenco. And it just was a very strong visceral response, feeling all of that come together. And there's a certain oneness about all of that. And it really reminded me how we are really one race, the, the human race, that's it. We're all together in this. And there's such a sense of connection and community and union and music makes all of that possible. Absolutely. That is the power of great music. And we thank you so much for joining us for our first conversation. I think it was a, a, a big success and all due to you, Sharon Isbin. The Maryland Symphony Orchestra thanks you, Sharon, and thanks all of those who are watching us on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we wish you uh, health and safety and more music more music. Thank you so much. You. I, I can't wait to do more music. And you can find the albums now online at uh, Amazon and any of your favorite providers. And in fact, I think you have a special, you can see that on the bottom of the screen. If you go to affinity.marylandsymphony.org, that'll take you right to the Amazon page for Affinity. Perfect. Thank you so much. Good evening. Thank you.